out. Disorder has broken out in Dublin's city centre following a suspected stabbing which left five people, including three children, in hospital. Protesters have fired flares and fireworks at police, while officers with riot shields have been deployed. Killian Sherlock, from the Press Association in Ireland, has been telling LBC the cause of the trouble is still under investigation. Initially, a police spokesman said they didn't believe the incident was terror-related activity and that it was a standalone attack but later the Garda Commissioner here uh, Drew Harris said they could not rule out any motivation. The government says it's going to look at further options to reduce migration after net figures were revised up for last year. 745,000 more people arrived in the UK than left the country in 2022, representing an increase of 139,000 on initial figures. The Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, has told LBC she was expecting the numbers to have fallen. We knew they were unusually high because of Ukraine, because of Hong Kong, but actually what's happened happened is there's been a very big increase in particularly in work visas in migration for work so I think yeah these net migration figures are extraordinary they are three times higher than they were at the time of the last general election and two people have been winched to safety by a crane operator after a fire broke out at a high-rise building at Reading in Berkshire. Witnesses say the flames were so fierce they saw large windows melting. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 14 points at 74.83. The pound buys $1.25 and €1.14. LBC weather. Rain in the south this evening will ease. Blustery showers in the far north tonight, but mainly dry elsewhere with a low of minus one degree. From Global's Newsroom, for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Three minutes past eight on LBC. If you just tuned in, welcome to the programme. Uh, you can watch this hour on Global Player. Uh, Nadine Doris joins me, former Conservative MP and Culture Secretary. She's got a new book out. It's called The Plot. It's uh, got a subtitle, The Political Assassination of Boris Johnson. Uh, Nadine, welcome. I, I've been Hello. really looking forward to doing this hour, but in a way slightly dreading it. Uh, because I mean, you and I have known each other for, what, 15, 20 years now? 20 years. And um, I was at your wedding. You were indeed. And I, 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 when I first started the book, I was thinking, am I going to enjoy this? Is this going to be something? Because what, what I was slightly dreading was interviewing you thinking, oh, my God, this, this book's <laughs> awful. But it, it's a real page turner. And I know you're a very successful novelist, fiction writer. Um, you haven't written this sort of as a dramatic novel, but there are passages in it that, that do read like that. Why did you decide to write the book in the first place? Because it's proved to be a very controversial book. Mm. So if I can just turn these questions around, the reason why it's proven to be controversial, I think, is that the people who don't want the story to be told had their rebuttals planned months ago. And I know this because I know people who were in discussions with them. And the rebuttals were, well, as soon as it's out, we're going to say it's a work of fiction. It's mm. a fantasy. And, and 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 then because they've done that, that kind of almost made it blow up. And the, the thing is, it's it's not actually my book here. My photograph isn't even on the jacket. It's a book of interviews with very many people. Some have been condensed, you know, two or three people into one, with very many people who who told me this. I had no idea when I started this book what I was going to find out. No idea. I think you would have had more of an idea than me when I started writing this. I didn't even know who these people were. I'd never heard of Mark McGregor. I'd never heard of Dougie Smith. I, well, I'd heard of Dougie Smith because I'd had an, a, a, a kind of an interaction with him. But I had no idea of his role in the party or how long he'd been around or how long he'd been the payroll at Conservative Central Office, how he appeared on no staff list, how he was at Rishi's right hand side giving him all of his, how he'd been working seven years to get Rishi to be Prime Minister. I knew none of this. You probably knew some of it. I didn't. So I started writing. And you were this, in the cabinet. Yeah. So I started writing this book completely knowing something really odd. So I knew two stories. And I thought, but these are completely under true, untrue. What is going on? So, and then something happened to me, which I detailed in the book about my advice note being changed to Prime Minister. And I thought... Well, just, I mean, since you mentioned that now, uh -huh. just explain that, because that is truly one of the most, most shocking things 
in the book where you, you as culture secretary, uh, had to appoint a new chair of Ofcom, one, mm-hmm. one of the biggest regulators in the country. I mean, yeah. other they regulate one us. One of the most important roles Absolutely. in the country. Absolutely. So just take us through what happened there because it is truly shocking. So there had been an interview process for a new head of Ofcom. Uh, when I arrived as culture secretary, it had been set up by Oliver Dowden. And I was informed by, it goes through, there is a, a kind of a Shawcross report, and when Shawcross oversees how, how this process takes place, and and I was constantly reassured as culture secretary that everything, that's one of the first thing I want to know, you know, is the process absolutely walked tight. And I was told that the the committee had found two people to be eligible for the role of the chair of Ofcom. One of them was Michael Lord Michael Grade, who has chaired Channel 4, BBC, ITV, held a number of regulatory jobs and chairman's jobs. And I wasn't surprised. He was almost an autograd. And then the second person they told me marked equally with him was a chap called uh, Lord Stephen Gilbert, who has worked in Conservative Central Office for 25 years. He's just been a backroom boy in Conservative Central Office, ran Theresa May's disastrous election campaign. And I just couldn't get my head around why the committee was telling me that these two men scored equally. It was like comparing chalk and cheese or, you know, apples and pears. So I said, OK, well, I'm going to choose um, Michael Gray. But you hadn't been involved in the interview process No, yourself. I'd arrived. This process had taken place under Oliver Dowden. I arrived mm. and it had been done. So I, in my, so what you do as a culture secretary is my, it's the prime minister's appointment. He can appoint anybody he wants, but he goes through the process and asks you as his secretary of state to give him the recommendations. So in my red box, the prime minister, in his red box that night, I put an advice note in, which said, you know, prime minister, been through the Ofcom uh, regulator chairs process. This is the person I recommend to be head of Ofcom. What happens is the next day the Prime Minister reads that and he signs it off and it goes back into the Cabinet Office, comes back to me at DCMS and the appointment's made. Anyway, very early the following morning, very early, I got a telephone call from somebody who I will never reveal in number 10, who said to me, I think you need to know that your advice note to the Prime Minister in his red box last night was removed from his red box and it was changed. And another person's name had been put in there and the person's name had been put in there was Stephen Gilbert. So I telephoned the Prime Minister and I said to him, he was on his way to see the Queen, and, and I said to him, we need to have a conversation. This is what has happened. And he said, OK, tell me now why, because he was confused as to why it happened himself. He said, tell me now, why do you want Michael Grade? And I went through the reasons why I wanted him and Michael's, you know, list of eminent qualifications for the role. And he said, you're my Secretary of State. That's your recommendation. That's who will be the chair of Ofcom. And I think it was his private secretary in the back of the car that he turned to and said this too. And then a few days later, Michael Grade was appointed. But before we got to that stage, I received a number of telephone calls from Manira Mirza, who is the wife of Dougie Smith, and, and, and then and, from and Dougie Dar- Smith. And head of the Prime Minister's Policy Unit yeah. at the time. Yeah, and then from Dougie Smith saying, you have to appoint Stephen Gilbert, not Michael Grade. And the phone call I got from this man, Dougie Smith, who I'd never spoken to in this you know, thick accent, was Scottish accent, was was intimidating. He was basically telling me that I had to appoint Stephen Gilbert and not Michael Grade. And I just could not understand why. Why would I appoint Stephen Gilbert? The man is not qualified. We're bringing the online safety bill through. We've just given them £34 million to just get themselves set up to regulate the online safety bill. We need someone who's got regulatory experience and has got experience of chairing a huge organisation. Why would I do that? So someone basically ripped up your letter and wrote a different one, presumably with your signature on the bottom. I think what they did was they crossed out the name, uh, Michael Grade, and wrote the name Stephen Gilbert in on my advice note. And who do you think did that? I'm never going to say because... Um, do you know? Yeah. Why won't you say? I do know. Yeah, I Wh- do know. Why won't you say? Well, I believe that it was Dougie Smith. Let's talk about Dougie Smith because um, I first met him in 1983 
He was a leading member of the Federation of Conservative Students. I had just set up a Conservative branch at my university. I had no knowledge of the Conservative Party internal workings or anything. And so this was my first conference that I'd been to, and it was in Durham. And I put myself forward to join the Federation of Conservative Students National Executive. Um, but I soon worked out that this was not a simple process because there were factions. And I now know, obviously, all political parties have these factions, but I was very naive and innocent as what, how old was I, 21 or something. And there was the um, so-called libertarian faction and the wets. And Paul Goodman, who now runs Conservative Home, was basically leader of the wets. I believe is a good friend of Dougie Smith's. I don't know that, maybe. Um, and Mark McGregor was, and Mark and we Glenn Denning and Dougie Smith were the three leaders of the sort of libertarian faction. Anyway, I ran as a non-faction candidate and just failed to get elected. And Mark McGregor said to me afterwards, why on earth didn't you tell us you were going to do this? We'd have had you on our slate. Um, and Dougie Smith was a very uh, charming, polite, um, very clearly very clever person who you, you could tell could go a long way in politics, but he has had, shall we say, um, a rather checkered mm. career since. Yeah, very much so. And, but he is basically, I mean, there are many characters that you describe in this book as um, effectively malign, but he's your main target in this book, isn't he? Well, there are a number of them. There's one I've had to codename Dr. No, because for, to get the book out, really, because um, what they would have done was probably put an injunction on the book I and mean, it would have delayed it for six months. It would have passed because the, the mm. stuff was all factual, but they would have delayed again. And, you know, we have already been through some quite tough legal stuff to get the book to... I mean, half of it's been left out to, to get to the point where we could actually publish it. So he's got a code name. Um, it's Dougie Smith and Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove is really because Michael Gove is the elected person who works with these people so closely I think I don't have a target but I think all roads lead back to Michael Gove but your contention is that there is this secret group of people who well you've they're not secret anymore because you name them all who over the years have effectively tried to control who runs the Conservative Party. Well, they do, and they have. I mean, you, you start off with the defenestration of Ian Duncan Smith, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I remember that period very well. Um, and you put that down to the likes of Dominic Cummings, Mark McGregor. Well, I don't. Ian does. That's So it's Ian's words, not mine. So I just went and interviewed Ian in his beautiful office, and he told me the story. And it was, you know, I've never talked to Ian one-to-one -one for so long. And it was, and it obviously by recounting what happened to him at the time, he put it so clearly. But you can obviously see you know, the things that they'd done. You could, you could see them being mirrored again and again. And it had obviously deeply upset him. But, you know, like going for the wife. So they went for Betsy. You know, he was completely cleared. But they knew once an inquiry was called that they had him because they could create all this heat and noise in the media and he would have to resign. And so they leaked all this. They had this story planned about his wife, Betsy, and expenses. And it was you know, famously called Betsy Gage at the time. They did the same with Boris Johnson and Carrie Johnson. Never any kind of like evidence produced behind it, but they did the same thing. And they did it with Akshata, Rishi's wife. But that's also one of the most shocking things that you say in the book, where Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane, you allege, were effectively leaking things to the press, deliberately designed to damage Boris Johnson, the man that they were supposedly working for. Well, from day one, and in fact, the last words in the book, in the kind of the... So, you know, I'd written this over a year, and it got to the point where so much that people had predicted during the writing of the book had come to pass by the time I'd written it. You know, someone told me halfway through, you know, Amber de Botan, who was head of comms, she'll be gone. Um, Dominic Raab will be gone. Um, you know, he stood in for Boris and Boris is sick because they'll, they'll make sure he's out. Ben Wallace, they'll go for Ben Wallace because he's one of the most popular ministers in the cabinet. They'll make sure he's out. They'll start. There will be stories leaked to the Times newspaper about Ben Wallace. And sure enough, you know, it happened. Ben had made these comments about Ukraine pop up. in the, It's always the Times newspaper, by the way. They pop up in the Times newspaper. Ben, you know, I'm having all this. He's gone. So many. But one of the most interesting things that was pointed out to me was actually by Laura Kunzberg. And it hadn't been picked 
picked up by any of the media at all, which I found interesting. And it's where she asks Dominic Cummings in an interview, I think it's in March 2020, and she says to him, you started planning to get rid of Boris Johnson months after he was elected, didn't you? And Dominic Cummings answers her, no, days. We, we planned to get rid of him days after the election because he was, he was useful to get the majority. We didn't want him as prime minister. We just wanted him to get that majority and then it was time to get him out. And that was one of the last things I discovered. And the reason why it's an afterword in the book is because Laura put a documentary out just a few weeks before this went to print. And I spotted it in that documentary, which I was also in. And I hadn't even been aware of that all the way along. Mm. And it's the use of the word we and how Boris got the phone call from Dougie Smith. You go now as Prime Minister and we might let you come back one day. Uh, and who's the we? I mean, is there some... Are you alleging that there is some sort of sinister group of anonymous people so no no they're not the anonymous no that are trying no, to no 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 because that all sounds very conspiracy theorish and most of this is i mean i think these are some of these individuals are quite um unstable and i think they fall out with each other a lot as well but can't actually live without each other and so they cause a lot of damage together so dominic cummings you know has been actively working against Boris. Imagine if it was Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell. Imagine if Tony Blair had gotten to Downing Street and Alistair Campbell immediately started to work against him to remove Tony Blair from the minute he got in. I mean, I don't think Tony Blair would have lasted as long as he had, but that's what they were doing with Boris from the moment he got in. Lots more from Dean in just a minute, and we'll be taking your calls after half past eight as well. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. <laughs> You hear that? That's the sound of your energy use going in reverse. Rewinding. Reducing. We're Ovo, an energy company that wants you to use less energy. Some may see that as a bit backwards, but we like to see things differently. Join us and see energy from a different angle. Ovo. At your work Christmas do, not feeling the canapes. Why not get a pick-me-up with McDonald's limited edition chicken Big Mac with two deliciously crispy chicken patties, our iconic Big Mac sauce and gherkins or not. Only available until the 3rd of January. Serve from 11am, subject to availability. Hey, Harry. Hello, mate. Got a nap lined up for today. Listen, pal, I may not look like the young stallion I once was, but I'm still fit as a fiddle, I'll have you know. No, no, Harry, that's not what I meant. I'm not even that old. I do boxer size three times a week and my trainer says... No, I mean the horses, your nap, your Napoleon, your best bet. Oh, well, you should have said that. My best bet would be to head over to Bet Victor and check out the latest offers they have on the horses. Listen to Harry and make your best bet on the racing at Bet Victor. 18 plus, be gamble aware. The magic of Christmas is sharing. That Lidl have won Supermarket of the Year at the Retail Industry Awards and which cheapest basket for October? That's award-winning Christmas dishes at prices that mean you'll be dining out on pigs in blankets all year. All the more reason to celebrate with us this Christmas. Now that's big on quality and always Lidl on price. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes NI. I'm an engineer designing structures with a lower environmental impact. I'm a climate scientist researching eco-friendly solutions I'm Steve, and I'm going green from my back garden. I decided to add solar panels to my home to generate my own cleaner electricity. And you could too. And by adding them to your home, you could save money on your bill. E.ON. Taking action for climate by generating cleaner electricity. Visit eonenergy.com to find out more. Energy efficiency eligibility regional requirements and T's and C's apply. Pandora's Black Friday promotion is here. Save up to 30% on charms and jewellery and make this Christmas unforgettable. But hurry, this offer won't be around for long. Ends 27th of November. Available in participating stores and online at pandora.net while stocks last. Terms and exclusions apply. Ian Dale. Text 84850. This is LBC. 21 minutes past eight. Nadine Doris is with us, former Conservative MP. She's got a book out called The Plot, The Political Assassination of Boris Johnson. Now, Nadine, uh, Rachel Reeves was on the programme last night, Labour Shadow Chancellor, and um, I put it to her that you had outed yourself as a fan of hers. 
obviously I, I appreciate anybody um, who wants to support our our, our policies and, and back me as um, the next Chancellor of the uh, Exchequer. And she's one of a number of Conservatives who are coming out and saying that our plans stack up. Uh, Ken Clark recently on a podcast uh, uh, also um, was complimentary about some of the things that I've been doing as um, Shadow Chancellor. And George Osborne as well has, um, has praised, for example, the commitment that I've made to to strengthen the powers of the Office for Budget Responsibility to stop any Chancellor or Prime Minister crashing the economy again. So, look, I welcome this praise. And a bit like Mark from the Wirral, who called in it a minute ago, there are many people who previously supported the Conservatives but don't feel that they deserve their vote right now. Um, you, so you have said that you think she would make a good Chancellor. I mean, it's quite something for somebody from the right to say that. Well, we've had um, a bit of a disaster, I think, in the last, since 2019. I don't think Rishi was a good Chancellor. I know from talking to Boris, as you will know, that, um, you know, he blocked everything. He was like, he was the bottleneck in the Treasury. Whatever anybody wanted in departments, whatever the Prime Minister asked for, was just stopped by the Chancellor. And now we have, um, obviously, uh, an interesting day yesterday. But I think... What we've been through since 2019 in terms, I think the country has been badly served by a previous chancellor who stopped policies because he didn't want them attributing to the then prime minister because he knew what was coming down the tracks in terms of his own movement into that place. And I think Rishi Sunak as chancellor served Rishi Sunak and didn't serve the country. He served his own personal ambition and not the people or the country or the party or the government. And so someone like Rachel... Sometimes I just think it's time, you know, women do a, women do take public service, I think, sometimes more seriously and do jobs for the right reasons. Now, Rachel, I've kind of known Rachel, you know, kind of like, not personally, but um, I, we've worked being colleagues in, in Westminster since I think she came in in 2010. And I've always just found her a thoroughly decent, nice person. And could, I would trust her. Could you vote Labour? You know, I've sacrificed a lot to be a Conservative. When you come from my background and you nail your colours to the blue mast, you sacrifice a lot. And I certainly have for my party. I've given 25 years of my life to it and sacrificed a lot to be a Conservative. And what I would rather do is rebuild the Conservative Party or see the Conservative Party rebuild with decent, good people and to be rid of some of the toxic um, behaviours that we have at the moment in the party and get back to being a party of core Conservative principles with people who put public service first and ambition second. And that is absolutely not the case at the moment, I'm afraid. Well, For the most part. But, uh, I mean, I can't imagine you voting Conservative while Rishi Sunak is, is uh, Prime Minister, given what you've said in the book. Yeah, it will be difficult. But not impossible. Oh, I just, you know, but let's talk about, you know, an election when the election's happening. I'm just at the moment... You're being I, uncharacteristically coy. I think at the moment I'm probably feeling the same way as a lot of Conservatives do, as they did in my constituency in Mid-Bedfordshire. They stayed at home. And I think that's, you know, if you look at the figures of Mid-Bedfordshire's election, mm. I think I, I had a majority of 25, which has been lost to a late 25,000, which has been lost to a Labour candidate. But a lot of Conservatives would say, well, that's your fault. Well, it's, how would it be my fault? Well, because you resigned and then didn't resign for a, for a very long time. I was still in the constituency. You know, I mean, I might not have been in Westminster standing up, making the most inane comments so that I could put them on Instagram or Twitter, which meant nothing, did nothing, achieved nothing, which is most... Of, you know, Westminster at the moment, it's amazing actually how many people said, oh, she hasn't spoken in Westminster... The chamber is just a theatre. The chamber is an opportunity for social media, for Instagram and Twitter shots and Facebook shots. Nothing that happens in the in the chamber actually means very much anymore. Very different from when I first got there 18 years ago, where, you know, we had great orators. I can remember being in the tea room and MPs flying from the tea room to hear George Galway speak, not because we agreed with him, because he was a tremendous orator and it was a massive debate going on because so many people disagreed with him. Ian Paisley, the same, you know, people running in to hear Ian Paisley. Um, 
They're just, there were just like people who, great debates went on when I first got there. There was an MP called Eric Forth who was a great mm. debater. People used to have, the chamber used to be for debating and serious subjects got discussed. It's not like that now, it's just for social media. I worked in the constituency hard and and I know, you know, I know the feedback I got from my constituents okay. via email. L- let me put a few points to you. A lot of people are saying here, this is just conspiracy theory madness, all Prime Ministers, Wish it was. all Prime Ministers have people who plot against them. This is nothing new. That, and let me go, go back to Margaret Thatcher. Obviously, there were people plotting to get rid of her all the time. So how is this new? And also, I mean, you do make Boris Johnson out to be quite a sort of saintly character. Oh, in, I don't think this. I did. I actually thought he'd probably fall out well, with me when he's read it. <laughs> in fact, I know he read it last week and he hasn't spoken to me since. So, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm supposed to be having lunch with them on Saturday, so if he cancels, I'll know. <laughs> he, he comes across, shall we say, much more sympathetically from from what you because a lot of this his own words. I mean, you've inter, you inter, sat him down and interviewed him on several occasions, and there is a certain naivety that comes across in the interviews that you do with him, where you slightly start to feel sorry for him, and then you think, well, hang on a minute, mate, you were Prime Minister. You allow, you appointed these people. There is no one to blame but yourself. So, ultimately, and he would, he would say the same, but he trusted Michael Gove. That was his big mistake, I think, and everybody thinks that. And I think he's now at the point of, you know, it's an interesting process with Boris over the year, from the first interview to the last one, And it was like I was watching him go through this process and get to the place where he was finally. And it was his big mistake to trust Michael Gove. And um, and he realises that now. Because Michael brought... So can I just explain, because listeners won't understand. So on the day he became Prime Minister, Michael had these ready-to-go people to staff... The Downing Street and um, Boris said, "Okay, then these are people you trust. These people, these are you know excellent people, Prime Minister." They all went to Downing Street. There was a Michael Gove person behind almost every desk in every part of Downing Street, and um, and they were, and it was a disaster. I can remember saying to somebody on that day, "What on earth is he doing? These are all Gove people." Mm-hmm. And I mean, I've never met Dominic Cummings. Um, well, which he's I'm, worked with Mike. He's met Michael Gove's side for twenty-three years. No, absolutely, and I couldn't understand that appointment. But there were other appointments where, for example, Henry Newman, who um, used to be a regular guest on my show. But there are several of them that are really good friends of Carrie's. So, I mean, your accusation is that all of these sort of Michael Gove people have spread their tentacles Well, you're talking about there are two people who were also friends of Carrie's who worked in Number 10. But I think probably Carrie met them when she was a spad and they worked for Gove. And so they didn't get into Number 10 through Carrie. They got into Number 10 through Gove. And they're closer to Gove than they are to Carrie. So they were they were part of the Gove appointments. And, yeah, I mean, it was... Um, but but, you I, but also I don't say, think he was I mean, naive because... But, but surely there had to be an end game here. I mean, you could say, well, the end game was getting rid of Boris, but what after that? What's the point of getting rid of a Prime Minister if you then have no real game plan apart from putting Rishi Sunak in his place? But to achieve what? So that's a really interesting question because it's not just being Boris Johnson and it's not just Rishi Sunak. They removed Ian Duncan Smith. They were inst- actually instrumental in the removal of David Cameron. So it was Michael oh, Gove. How? Well, so Michael Gove, uh, David Cameron, ne- needed to have collective responsibility in the Cabinet so he could put the country's weight behind Remain, was absolutely gobsmacked that Michael Gove... I mean, David Cameron's memoirs are really interesting re- reading. Absolutely gobsmacked that Michael Gove said, no, I'm going to vote leave. There is no way that Michael Gove, you know, many people said there is no way that Michael Gove was actually a true Brexiteer. It was bizarre, you know, the, the way they behaved when the results but came in. But people say Boris Johnson wasn't either. Well, actually, he was. He's the person who's delivered Brexit. But he, so, he wrote two articles, so he clearly wasn't as committed as you were or many other people well, were. Well, um, so you're talking about the February the 20th, 20, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I am not... Um, so actually, I never discussed that with Boris, and I, they're not true because what is discussed is that February the twenty article when he rang Tim Shipman in the middle of the night and said this is not true. So that's discussed in there, and Tim Shipman's read that. You know, the phone call happened; it wasn't true. 
So what, there's so a lot written, of he stuff. He hadn't written two articles. So, I, so I'm not going to... I don't know, but Ian, you know, if you'd asked me, I'd have looked up or asked Boris before I came. I don't know. But I know that story that was put in the Times on that February the 20th article was untrue. Um, but I'd like to say, just, I wish just, it was just, conspiracy theory, which is what one of your messages is. It's not. It's the words of people who've been there throughout numerous leaders in the Conservative Party and have seen the same people pulling the same tricks over years. And why does it matter? It matters because Conservatives are in government more than the Labour Party ever are. And it matters because the people who go out and vote, that is all they have. Their hope, their power lies Fine. in their vote. And when other people take their votes and then decide what they are going to do with them once that Prime Minister is put in place, that is a that is a deficit of democracy. And that is important. But Sarah Vine, who was married to Michael, I don't know whether she still is or not, but they're, they're not together anymore. Um, she wrote on the 9th of November, I'm sorry, Nadine, but the idea that Michael was never a Brexiteer is simply not true. If anything, it was Boris Johnson who was in two minds about the whole thing. I was there, remember. I understand that you have a narrative and that's fine, but there is a limit. Yeah, so it's Sarah Vine who said to Michael, you were only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. So, and also, um, I think there is some investigation going on at the moment because Michael has been uncovered as being a, a, a member of some pro-EU organisation where something was reported, I don't, I don't say too much because it was reported recently, that that's an investigation because at the same time he was a member of a pro-EU organisation. So I'm afraid I don't believe for a moment and I don't think David Cameron believed for a moment that Michael Gove was a Brexiteer. Just okay. don't believe it. Right, we will continue in just a moment and also take some calls. It is 8.32. Tim Daly has the news headlines. A delayed four-day pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas is due to begin at 5 o'clock UK time tomorrow morning. 13 women and children currently being held hostage in Gaza will be the first to be released. The head of Ireland's police service is calling for calm heads this evening following an attack on a woman and three children in Dublin. Disorder has broken out in the city centre with protesters firing flares and also fireworks at officers. And senior Conservatives are demanding Rishi Sunak act now on net migration. It's after revised figures showed levels to the UK reached a record 745,000 last year. LBC weather, rain in the south will ease this evening but blustery showers in the far north tonight. Elsewhere, mainly dry with a low of minus one degree. This is LBC. This is what award-winning customer service sounds like from real Octopus Energy calls. Just like to say how very happy I am with Octopus Energy. And you're so friendly when you're on the phone, so thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. Well, give, give credit where it's due. Octopus Energy, outstanding service at fair prices. Paddington is back in McDonald's Happy Meal. Join him in discovering all the fun of the festive season, like ice skating, pulling crackers... Singing songs and even playing games. But the best thing is, everyone can enjoy the magic with Paddington and Happy Meal. Have a very berry Christmas with Paddington. Some fun, some food, it's all inside this Happy Meal. Until 3rd of January from 11am includes one pre-selected book or toy while stocks last. See mcdonalds.co.uk slash happy meal for details. So gambling, gambling to me was like, like monsoon. The first rain, the first bet. It brings comfort and joy, but then is a flood. It's not a nice feeling. You think you're in control, but you're not. You need that help. If you're worried about how gambling makes you feel, we can help. Search Gamble Aware for advice, tools and support. It's easy to find the perfect package holiday with EasyJet Holidays. Looking for outdoor adventure in North Iceland? Hmm. Warm. Relaxing in warm geothermal springs after exploring breathtaking ice waterfalls. Getting warmer. Or snowmobiling over powdery slopes with the Northern Lights for company. Found it. Find your perfect winter holiday in North Iceland. Book now with only a £60 per person deposit, with flights to Akareri, bags and hotel included. Search EasyJet Holidays. Selected travel dates, holidays at all protected. T's and C's apply. Jill Scott, Queen of the Jungle. I'm one of my favourite clients. Listen, I know you said you were done with football, but here's the kicker. There's a new show in production called Jungles for Goalposts. Contestants face football challenges in the heart of the jungle. Trip vines dribbling past lions, I expect. So can I tell them you'll be the presenter? I mean, I already have. That's better. That. 
Tetley. Octopus Energy is the only witch recommended energy supplier six years running. Octopus Energy, outstanding customer service at fair prices. Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It is 8.36 on LBC. You can watch us on Global Player. Nadine Doris is here, author of The Plot, The Political Assassination of Boris Johnson. Now, I have so many more questions, but I'm going to hand it over to the listeners for the moment. Lawrence is in Wembley. Hi, Lawrence. Hello, hello Ian. Um, <clears throat> good evening, Nadine. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, speak to you this evening. Hello, Lawrence. And you too. Um, yeah, uh, I came across you by accident on GB News, which gave me um, a wholly different uh, insight in, into yourself. And I think... Um, I think she's uh, on the other side, not not that one. <laughs> I'm on talk TV. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, get on with your question, Lawrence. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, you were due to take your place in the House of Lords. Um, I understand that... Uh, uh, you were blocked. Um, it, is this something that it was out of malice? And I, I didn't fully understand why that uh, you would have been great uh, and we would have been great to have you in that. I watch a lot of debates and I think, um, yeah, it's well, a great it was, loss. It was because I was writing this book, Lawrence. So I've been through um, quite a process, actually, with number 10 and... I'm very sure if I'd made the statement that I was going to, if I'd agreed to abandon the book, then um, I'm very sure my my um, appointment would not have been blocked. Because you've I, had a letter recently, haven't you? From yeah, me? I had a letter the day before the book was serialised in the Daily Mail. It kind of said, um, if you do this, you will receive no public appointments and you will never have a public appointment and you will never be appointed to the House of Lords. And that was written by Sue Gray's successor yeah. in the ethics unit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is slightly Simon ironic, Madden. given that she's somebody who you talk about quite a lot in the yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd be very worried if I were Labour, actually. I think if they start finding out that they're having really bizarre leaks from the leader's office, they had one a couple of weeks ago, which is quite confusing, and they don't know where and why stuff is happening, they might want to look a little bit closer to home. That's quite an accusation to make. <laughs> I didn't say any names. I just said no, they might want to look I closer think to we home. We all know what your implication was. <laughs> but you see, a lot of people think that this basically is your dish best served cold. It's your revenge on Rishi Sunak. <laughs> no, honestly, I actually liked Rishi. Um, well, you could have fooled me from what you write yeah, about. No, him. I mean, he's. I liked Rishi until I realised what he'd been doing over the period of seven years, how he got his seat in Richmond, how he's been working with Dougie Smith and Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings and others to become Prime Minister, how he used to tell Boris shortly after the election. I think what Rishi did was he was captured by these people. And I think Boris might say that in the book. You know, he might have started out with good intentions, but kind of got captured and got taken along with it and once you've been taken along so far there's no reversal you know you can't go anywhere else so like Keir Starmer you think he's basically a weak man yeah no very weak and he's I don't think he knew anything about politics so people like Dougie Smith and others have been the people who've like guided him along and they've been and you know when he started probably you know when the stuff came out about Akshata's non-dom status and all this sort of stuff that was them letting the, airs out, the air out of his tyres. He was probably becoming quite confident, like, well, we've got here now, you know, we're going to, Boris Johnson's going to go, I'm going to become Prime Minister. And they're like, well, no, we'll just let the air out of your tyres a little bit, just bring you down a bit, make well, sure you're dependent you on us. It's not me, it's other people. It's, you know, as I said, I started writing this book and I didn't even know any of these people. But, you know, the people I've spoken to are former prime ministers, former chancellors, former cabinet ministers, present cabinet ministers, people who've been very close in central office, who've been at the top of central office, who've worked with closely with these people. So it's it's not my, no, it's not my story. Very few of the words actually attributed to me. It's other people's so, stories. Somebody said to me the other day that they, they'd read your book. This is before I started reading it. And they, their theory was that you had come up with the idea that there was a plot. And therefore, <laughs> you, you, you've tried to sort of mould the evidence in the book to come to the conclusion that you wanted to come no, to. No, it's the other way around. It's literally the other way around. It was, I started writing, and, I, you know, I didn't decide to do the book. I had some of these conversations with people, and then it became apparent to me 
that I had to, because I know, haven't enjoyed this process of writing the book. In fact, to be honest, I've hated it. And I'll, it's the only non-fiction book I will ever do in my life. I will never do another one. There is none of the creativity, none of the the joy of writing with doing a factual book. I'll never do it again. I don't know how you do it, Ian, because there's just no joy in writing books that are <laughs> factual. There's no pleasure in I it. I get other people to do them for me. It's oh, well, there you go. Simpler. That's what it is. Right, no, that's it. It's the, literally the other way around. The, the plot evolved as the more people I interviewed. Right, let's go to Billy, who is in Ventnor on the Isle of Wight. Hello, Billy. Hi, good evening, Ian, and good evening, Nadine. Lovely to speak to both of you. Thank you. I just have a, I just have a question for Nadine, and that is, I know in the book you mentioned Dr No, mm -hmm. and it's just a question I'm curious to hear from you, Nadine. Why didn't you use parliamentary privilege to announce who Dr No was before stepping down as an MP? Um, that's because I stepped down during the recess and it was my intention to when I'd actually confirmed both with journalists and police and records and other people um, that, that, that I was probably going to use parliamentary privilege to do that because what I uncovered um, was some quite shocking stuff, including, you know, redacted court records, redacted so, uh, things on the internet, redacted. And I was going to use that. But it got to the position where I think now, you know, th th now I am putting a conspiracy hat on because there were uh, daily briefings against me from number 10 going out in the media. In fact, if you look at the Times newspaper throughout July and August, I think they put out maybe two, three stories a week about me. And it began to kind of like, I had people from cabinet saying to me, please do not go, do not listen to these stories. If you go, we'll lose your seat. And I had number 10 constantly putting these briefings out. And a little part of me was thinking, is it because they know I may be using parliamentary privilege in the future? But, you know, you know, I've got a family and I've got a soul. And having these stories going out about you in the media through a many of them you know just like regurgitating really awful stuff is it just is it worth it and I decided that um, I should stand down and there should be a by-election in my constituency what I was holding on for was that you know to be able to use um, that parliamentary privilege but the personal cost to me was becoming too much Dr No I mean I, I've worked out who Dr No is it's, you, you don't hide hide it I think very successfully oh but the barristers think we've do they? Pinned it very well, yeah. Okay. Will you ever reveal? So you know, so I, so I can just say this book has been through not only the in-house lawyers at Harper Collins, it then went through an external um, forensic barrister who specialises in this kind of stuff. You know, they do spook books and stuff, and it went through through there. And then before it actually went in the Daily Mail and be serialised, it went through the Daily Mail group. Um, team of lawyers so you know this book has been legal to death you should see the stuff that I couldn't put in that the barristers took out well I hope the publishers will pay you libel uh, bills but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right we'll take more calls in just a moment it's uh, 8.45 LBC Peloton knows that working out takes willpower discipline motivation and a good deal doesn't hurt either to be fair Right now, get up to £500 of selected Peloton Bike Plus and Tread packages to help get you up and running. Or cycling, or yogaing, or boxing, or meditating, or stretching. It's kind of a big deal. Offer ends 28th of November 2023. Internet connection and Peloton all access membership at £39 per month required. Terms apply. See onepeloton.co.uk. Come on, Katerina. You can handle this heat. One event at a time. Throw together a decent ragu, jump straight onto the Malaysian curry, bring it home with the chilli. Yeah, I'll boss this batch cook. Perform better on Sundays. Get half price electricity, 11am till 4pm with Peak Save from British Gas. Proud partners of Team GB and Paralympics GB. Ends 31st of December. T's and C's apply. Smart meter required. Wrapping presents. Before you try and find the end of the tape, again, take time to treat yourself at McDonald's. Introducing the big and cheesy, with or without bacon. 100% beef patty, delicious cheese sauce, crispy onions, even more cheese sauce, and a freshly toasted snowflake bun. Available until the 3rd of January. Serve from 11am, participating restaurants only. Subject to availability. I want to live... OK, this might not be something you hear every day, but your next poo could save your life. 
Just a tiny sample detects signs of cancer before you notice anything wrong. That's how NHS bowel cancer screening kits help to save thousands of lives a year. It's so simple, yet one of the most important things you'll do. So, if one lands on your doormat, put it by the loo. Don't put it off. This is an ad for something impressive. I mean, just listen to my impressive voice. Reserved for describing impressive things, like Michelangelo's David, a chess grandmaster's inner monologue, and Volvo's latest offer. Save up to £10,650 on a range of new Volvos, including their mild hybrid, plug-in hybrid and fully electric cars, and take advantage of 0% APR. Mmm, impressive. Order online or visit your local Volvo retailer today. Now, for some impressively fast legals. Figure based on XC90 plug-in hybrid excludes the X30 and the X90. 50% minimum deposit. Finance provided by Volvo Car Financial Services UK Limited. Term supply. Ian Dale on LBC. Nadine Doris is here, former Conservative MP and the author of the new book, The Plot, The Political Assassination of Boris Johnson. Do, do you think that Boris Johnson was just guilty of being incredibly naive and, and too trusting in people? So one of the problems with Boris, we said some, a cabinet minister who I won't name in our last cabinet meeting ever with Boris said, um, Prime Minister, you're kind, but you're too kind. You're nice, but you're too nice. You're loyal, but you're too loyal. And if niceness is a crime, it's the bit, you know, that you don't see of Boris Johnson. He, he is a very loyal, kind person. And I think that's... He, he made the mistake of when Michael Gove went to him and apologised and said, you know, we've, we've, got to, we've got to look forward now, you know, and we've got this 80 majority, we've got to work together on this. And he trusted him. And I think that was his mistake. If he's too trusting, he was too trusting. But, you know, by the same token, I try to see this from his perspective. He's known Michael Gove since he was 18 years old. And for all of that time, you know, he's 59 now, for all of the time that he's known Michael Gove, it has been a good relationship, although you know, everybody knows you know, what Michael Gove's Well, we've got a question on this from Christine in Bromley. Christine, hi. Hi. Hi, Ian. Thank you for having me on, particularly as Nadine is on. Nadine, I have followed Boris Johnson's career really since 2006 when he published a book called The Dream of Rome in which he expressed his Eurosceptic feelings and compared them with the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and said, well, you know, the question was, why isn't the Eurozone working as well? So I go a long way back and I go even further back as a Brexiter. You have just said something that I absolutely have intuited just from my reading and thinking about things. I've always been interested in politics. I was a left-wing Brexiter, but I can never return to the left wing. When Boris entered Parliament, it was my impression... Christine, we need a question. Sorry, question, yes. The question is, and my question to your producer some time ago was, is Boris's strength and weakness, his loyalty, because I've always believed him to be loyal. Michael okay. Gove is only one person who stabbed him in the back. I believe. Sorry, I won't go on. All right, but, Christine, we, we've got the, we've got the question, but just to add to that, Nadine, before you before you answer that, um, a former colleague of yours said to me once that there is not a single person that Boris Johnson has encountered that he's never let down. So it? it's just not true. It just isn't true, and it's kind of like one of those um, mythical things. Somebody, said, I think it was Charles Moore, who might have been the person who said that originally, and you know. There are people that Boris Johnson has had to let down. That's because when you're prime minister, everybody wants something from you. And the one thing I will say about Boris is, um, you know, people would go to him and ask him for things often because I don't know why, because they, you know, they thought they were entitled to them or and I'm talking about, you know, knighthoods and damehoods and and he didn't. 
And he doesn't give people, you know, always what they ask for. And I think those people can be disappointed. But it's not the case that he lets. And, you know, and I'd say, you know, that I'm one of those people. It's amazing that people say to me, oh, you didn't get your, you went in the laws because you didn't put you on the list, he let you down. Just not true. You know, I'm happy to debate truthful facts, but it just isn't true. And I could point you to a dozen people right now who would say exactly the same as I am. He has a very small group of friends and, you know, he is loyal to them all and they're all loyal to him. When you're a politician, you have to, you know, you don't have lots of acquaintances. It's very difficult. Uh, but I would just say that just isn't true. It might be that someone thought they should have been promoted or they should have stayed in cabinet or remained in cabinet or should have been made a sir or, you know, a baron or whatever. And when he doesn't deliver, they perceive that because they get on well with him as being let down. But you just... said earlier that you know he's read the book. He hasn't contacted you since then. <laughs> I know you're having lunch with him on Saturday. I ho am. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. I'll let you know but who cancels. But isn't there that <laughs> slight feeling that, well... I mean, he clearly wanted you to do the book, otherwise he wouldn't have cooperated with you on it. I mean, do you not feel that you might be the next person that he lets down? No. And, you know, somebody said this to me a little while ago, and I just thought, in what way could he let me down? How could he let me down? Well, by cutting you off. Um, that, that, you know, if he didn't like the book, he might fall out with me for a couple of days, and then he'll be fine after. You know, I know him well enough to know that if he was really angry with this book, if he really didn't like it... He probably wouldn't speak to me until Saturday when I was due to arrive for lunch. And if I turned up with a good cheese board and a good bottle of wine, he'd forgive me instantly. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that lunch. Do, <laughs> do you think he can ever come back into politics and as Prime Minister? I honestly don't think he wants to. I just think he's in really enjoying life. He's um, got this beautiful, beautiful house in Oxfordshire. Um, and he's, you know, he's not doing his big projects in the country now. He's doing his projects at home. I do think... I think it's a tragedy when I look at where we are now in the polls and where we are on the day that Boris Johnson arrived as Prime Minister. I think it's a tragedy that somebody like him arrived with levelling up, running through his veins and that being his big project. And I know this because, you know, as a Secretary, in D Secretary of State in DCMS, he was hounding me over broadband because he saw that as an absolute essential component of levelling up. And he's... Or oh, sorry, gigabit rollout, you know, just like what percentage are you today? What, constantly. And I just see him as the person who delivered, you know, the vaccine programme. For anybody who wants to be like, I've heard somebody being quite sniffy about that the other day. I happen to know that he's the person who picked up the phone and stopped the vaccine going to Merck in America. I know, I happen to know he's the person who made sure that it stayed in the UK, that we were the first country to get a vaccine in the arm. I know that he was the first person to drive us out of restrictions and lockdown restrictions, which put us in a very economically viable position compared to the rest of Europe, which has been blown now. But, you know, I see him as a prime minister who delivered. And I look now and I saw him as a prime minister with vision. You know, he had these big ideas about what he wants to do in the country. And I look at, you know, where we are now and we have nothing. And I think he said to me in one of the conversations in the book, what was it? And you asked me this question at the beginning of this interview. What has this all been for? What has removing Boris Johnson been for? Are we, have we got big ideas? Are we on this big project? Do we have these great things going on? Are we surging ahead in the polls? Where are we now as a concept? We're facing wipeout. We've gone from an 80-seat majority with Boris Johnson and we're facing almost wipeout. And I can I could guarantee you this. If Boris Johnson walked out on the streets of Grimsby or Scunthorpe or any of the places in those red wall seats or Newcastle under Lyme or one of those seats where we won back, where people lent him their votes... To, to take that big majority. If he went into one of those those towns today and walked on the streets, he'd be mobbed in the same way that he used to Do be. Do you think he'll campaign for Rishi Sunak at the next election? Well, that is a big question. That is a big question, well, and I'm not sure. Well, you know, and, you know better than most. The one thing I do know, well, that's probably one of the things we're going to be talking about on Saturday. One of the things that I do know is that if some of those MPs want to save their seats... Oh, they, will, they will all want him in the way that in the major government they all wanted Margaret Thatcher to They come. will want him out on the streets mm. with them. They'll want him to be seen in their constituencies. But, will he do it? I'm not sure. But, but, I mean, he was remarkably kind to Rishi Sunak in some of the meetings he's had with him since he was deposed or since he resigned. Um, and again, I mean, OK, 
it's to his credit, I suppose. But again, that shows a sort of slight weakness of character in politics, doesn't it? Because he maybe he just wasn't ruthless enough. No, because his loyalty to the Conservative Party is you can't shake him on that. You can't move him on that. You know, that's where his loyalty is to the Conservative Party. Well, and he would see being, wasn't it, didn't somebody, someone showed me a tweet the other day that someone had put out when he went saying, just watch how unpleasant he will be to Rishi Sunak now that he's gone. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was a journalist. Just watch how nasty he will be. You've, you've not seen Boris Johnson's mm. nastiness yet, but you'll see it now in how he is to Rishi Sunak. He's been nothing but pleasant to him. Right, let's take this call from Darren, his first-time caller in Westminster. Hi, Darren. Oh, hi there. Um, I mean, I'm listening to this interview. It's, you know, it's just unbelievable that we're talking about Boris Johnson this in, in such a sugar sugary sweet this sugar treat characterization of Boris Johnson is so far from the truth. It's it's almost like we're in a parallel universe. I mean, this is a man that lied week after week after week. I mean, this story about Doctor lied Nora, to who? Sorry, he lied to his colleagues. Can I finish? He lied to his colleagues week after week after week. I mean, this whole fiction about Doctor No. I mean, I'm just wondering when we're going to hear about James Bond. I mean, do you remember? I mean, you're saying that somebody called Dougie Smith and this, you know, cabal of people uh, uh, cloaked in in secrecy undid Boris Johnson. What undid Boris Johnson was Boris Johnson. Do you remember how many MPs got completely frustrated with his lies after lie after lie, week after week, and how many MPs resigned? I mean, I think in the end, we almost got to 30 or 40 MP on the day that... All right, da- Darren, day. Darren, do you have a question? Well, yeah, it's, it's that why... This is, it's, it's a ridiculous thing to retell history. Boris Johnson... No, 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 I've Boris asked Johnson, you, do you have a question? Yes. Why, why is she creating this fiction when everyone... We, we were there, we witnessed it. What's this fiction about? Because we saw Boris Johnson undoing himself by telling lies and okay. his MPs resigned. OK. I mean, that plays into the narrative that a lot of your critics have, that you're somehow sort of slightly in love with Boris Johnson. Oh, God, I don't know. Well, you didn't say that, actually, but I'll just come back on some of the points that he said. Um, so, you know, I wanted to ask him what... Because, again, there's this narrative that runs away, you know, this liar narrative, because he went to the dispatch box and said that there were... I can't remember the exact words now, but, you know, no parties taking place. Well, if you read the book, you'll see that they did take place every Friday night when he wasn't in number 10. And the people who sent him to the dispatch box to say that were doing so with the very people who were organising and attending the parties, but had their own skins to save for various reasons. Um, so you don't believe he ever told a lie as Prime Minister? I think all... Oh, you know, I don't... Well, you know, if you were talking about specifics, I'd have to... I don't think knowingly ever told a lie, no. And I think you'll be saying the same thing about Keir Starmer, you know, when he becomes... if he becomes Prime Minister in the future. But, you know, can I just make the point that because what that caller has just said is he used the word fiction... This book is not my story. I didn't know any of this. And you know, the book is, if people read it, it's you know a, a, a great chapter for me and Duncan Smith. And um, you know there are people directly quoting people like Linton Crosby. I think there are five chapters, short chapters of interviews with Boris. These are other people's words. Mm. They're not mine because I didn't know the story. I didn't know these people. And did you know how to say that a caller just said, um, you know, know, somebody called Dougie Smith? And this is another thing, you know, like Dougie Smith doesn't exist. He's been paid, he's being paid at the moment 100 grand. He's paid huge amounts of money by the Conservative Central Office, Conservative Party. But Conservative Party members pay their subs to pay this huge salary for this man that nobody's ever heard of, that nobody ever sees. One Tory MP said, I think this Dougie Smith character's made up, which is just laughable. He's Rishi Sunak's well, I, main advisor. I can assure you he's not made up. Uh, I've known him since 1983. Or well, no, of him anyway. Um, final question. On a scale of one to ten, how excited were you by the return of David Cameron to government? <laughs> God, I keep getting asked this question. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll say what I've said before. Uh, oh, how boring. Not very. <laughs> <laughs> well, you voted for him, I remember, in the 2005 I did. leadership contest. I did, I did, at yeah. Least you, at least you had the balls to tell David Davis to his face. I did. God, you you're were, going back some now. I, well, I am. I think that was when I first met you. 
Was it? Yeah, yeah. you were working for David 18, Davis. 18, you were his chief of staff. Years ago. God, yeah, yeah, that's true. Happy yeah. days, not. Well, they weren't. <laughs> Nadine, thank you so much for coming in. Nadine's book is called The Plot. The subtitle is The Political Assassination of Boris Johnson. Whatever you think of Boris Johnson, whatever you think of Nadine, I can tell you, if you buy this book and read it, you will enjoy it and you'll learn a lot about how government operates or possibly shouldn't operate. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking to Gideon Falter, Chief Executive of the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. They've organised Britain's first national solidarity march against anti-Semitism for this Sunday. Why has anti-Semitism become such a problem in Britain over the last 10 years and particularly, as we've seen, over the past few weeks, where the number of anti-Semitic attacks has gone up by about tenfold? And uh, Gideon will be taking your calls as well. 0345 6060 973. That's the number to call here on LBC. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, there have been violent clashes near the scene of an attack in Dublin where a five-year-old girl and a woman in her 30s were seriously injured. A six-year-old girl and a five-year-old boy were also injured in the suspected stabbing which happened outside a school at lunchtime. Superintendent Liam Garrity from the Irish Garda has been describing some of the injuries. One girl aged five years has sustained serious injuries. One boy aged five years and a girl aged six years who received less serious injuries were brought to CHI Crumb for treatment. The boy has since been discharged. Trouble has been continuing in the area around O'Connell Street this evening with rioters looting a footlocker store and attacking police. 13 women and children being held hostage in Gaza will be the first to be released tomorrow when a temporary truce between Israel and Hamas begins. Palestinians are expected to be released from Israeli prisons in exchange. Chief Foreign Affairs columnist for the Financial Times, Gideon Rackman, has been telling LBC Israel's trying to calm fears on that issue. I think the Israelis are going to release 150 who are, I think, said to be all either women or uh, young people. And the Israelis claim to their own public that none of them directly implicated in terrorism. A man's been arrested after a Jewish woman's car was set alight in North London. The Metropolitan Police says the 55-year-old was detained on Thursday on suspicion of arson and racially aggravated harassment. And the former Conservative MP Nadine Doris has told LBC the party needs to be rebuilt. She's been speaking following her resignation from